All right, we ready? Okay, let's go. We can jump into James and and call it a night tonight. Okay. James. James was Jesus' brother. That's good. All right, here we are. Book of James, the son of Mary and Joseph. He was the half-brother of the Lord. And this we find in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It's kind of interesting. I was reading something about this, and you know, they make this whole point. I'm doing something on the uh, on the seven sayings of Christ on the cross, and they're saying like, you know, this there's this whole case that they make that this proves that Mary didn't have any other children because Jesus didn't give Mary to James or anybody else. He gave him to, gave her to John, and <laughs> it's like it's like so crazy. My uh, like. My father was taught that Joseph was a saint because he never had relations with Mary. You know, they never had, they never, Mary, Mary and Joseph never had sex. That was basically what the priest told my dad. And my dad came, I was, you know, he said, he went to church on St. Joseph's Day to the Mass and came home. He said, the priest just said this. Now, I don't believe that's true. And I said, it's not true, Dad. I said, it says in the Bible that, that James and Jude were, were brother. That Jesus had brothers and sisters. And they, you know, it's it's really crazy. But James was the brother of the Lord, and and Paul also makes reference to this. He was a leader in the church of Jerusalem, and he he became, he got a name called Old Camel Knees. He became named, known as Old Camel Knees because he was such a prayer warrior. And there is sort of a story that. Um, James was asked to help uh, to help during the the uh, the Roman occupation uh, and the destruction of Jerusalem, and you know he was asked and he was he was allowed to preach, and then he was knocked down from the top from the top of you know he was thrown down from the thrown down from the temple and then killed with a uh, killed with something they used to. Uh, to clean robes or something like that, some sort of metal object. So that's the history of who James is. But, um, you know, he has a, you know, this was either written in 47, 48, or 60 and 62. There's two views of this, early James, late James. But that's one of those disputes that doesn't really change the essence of this. It's a very different kind of, but when you get to this, when you get to this book, your things are really, it's different from any of the other uh, you know, there's a change in sort of the tone of the New Testament. This is like maybe another proverbial kind of book. So it's really written, again, like Hebrews was written for a Jewish audience. James was written also to Jewish believers who would disperse throughout the Roman Empire. That was his audience. That's what he was looking for. So, again, the persecution's coming, and he wants to comfort the persecuted. And he wants to commend... Uh, what he sees as pure religion. And then, you know, he really wanted this idea of people could believe the Bible but not be a doer of the word. And so he's making this point that, you know, faith without works is dead. If there's no evidence of your faith in your behavior and your activity, then the chances are is that you don't really have the faith of the Son of God. So it's a loaded statement. This these kinds of statements were were um, uh, were things that Martin Luther had a problem with. Martin Luther had a problem with the book of James. John Calvin had a problem with the book of Revelation. Martin Luther had a problem with the book of James. Like, is this really scripture? There's a question, an epistle of straw. But it stayed, it stayed in our Bible. It's useful. It tells us a lot about uh, the tongue, and it's, 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 an, it's a different kind of literature. It's a different kind of literature. So it's, uh, you know, it's giving us some, some ideas for living life in a proper way. All right. So the main theme is that there is wisdom from above that's better than the wisdom from below. So if you lack wisdom, God will give it to you. So are you missing this? Now, what is wisdom? It's application of knowledge. Okay. You can have a lot of knowledge, but you don't apply it. You can know a lot of things, but you don't, you know, you can have the manual 
to your espresso machine, but if you don't use your espresso machine, your manual isn't really doing you any good. You read the manual, you know how to do it, but you don't use it. So wisdom is application. Uh, if any of you lacks wisdom, James 1.5, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So brethren, doer, works, and tongue. I think those are the words that you'll see here again. The wisdom of God. You need wisdom so that the suffering, the, the thing that he says you need wisdom for is because you're suffering. It's like there's trials. You have to understand like how to apply the things you know in the midst of your suffering. It's like wisdom is really squeezed out of people in the midst of pressure. So, you know, it's when you have to practice what's been preached to you that it really becomes a part of you. So, all right, next. All right, so uh, this is really like a style. If you read the Sermon on the Mount and you read this, you'll see that these things sort of go together. It's like, it's like Proverbs with illustrations, and there's no real personal references. So this isn't like really, uh, I'm a bond servant of God to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. And he's just going to start talking. Doesn't, there's you no... Know, um, you know, count it all joy when you're in various trials. That's the thing. Obviously, people were in trouble, and he's saying, I want you to know that you, can be, you should be joyful in the trial. That's like, you know, it's a powerful statement. Uh, so how does it relate to other books? The books of Paul talk about the justification before God, like we are justified before God based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He will not leave us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So we are justified. We have the, the, the wages of sin have been paid, so we belong in the presence of God. But James is saying there's another kind of justification. There is a demonstration of who you are in Christ, and that's you know, your justification before men. All right, And Paul says the root of faith, James is speaking of the fruit of faith. You plant a seed, it gets watered, it grows, and then if it's a good tree, it's a healthy tree, what does it produce? Fruit that other people can partake of. So he's, you know, Paul has given us definite idea of the roots of our faith, who Jesus is, what he did, how he did it, how permanent that, um, the, that activity is. Hebrews really re-clarified this, and really for the Jewish audience, these two books go very well together. This is who Jesus is. He died for you once for all. He's never leaving you nor forsaking you. With that in mind, it would be good if you walked this way. It would be good if you talked this way. It would be good if you asked God, are you, are you lacking something that you need to survive the trouble that you're in? Ask God. He'll give it to you. So root of faith, fruit of faith here in James. Okay. So there is, um, in these other, these next few people, next few books that we're looking at, James is more like an ethical book, ethics of Christian living. There's a stress on the prayer and the practice of our faith. Peter is going to give us some experiential emphasis on hope and knowledge. Now again, James and Peter and Jude, all these books are really written at a time when there's trouble going on. John's books and then Revelation are written about 20 years after this, and they come to us about 90 A.D., but right now in these 60s, 80, 90 is when John's books will show up. Uh, but James right now and he and Peter, uh, James and Peter are writing to people who are nearly always in trouble and trying to stay uh, focused on the faith. So um, ethical practices while you're under trouble. Peter is going to talk about the inner experience while you're going through the trouble. Remember who you are, Peter will say. And John's books will be on edification, focus, and love, and Jude will be exhortation, highlights. Jude, Jude and James, they go, they, you know, the two brothers of the Lord, give us like two really nice little ways of how to handle the conflict that we're in. And that's, you know, ethically and uh, spiritually. And uh, so when we get to Jude, we'll talk about that. That'll be next week. But Peter, John, and Jude next week. All right. James chapter 1, the first part, patience in trial. And the best way 
to learn and develop patience is to practice the truth. It's like they go, uh, you know, James is making a really profound kind of statement. Like, And I think the thing is, why did Martin Luther have such a problem with this? Because he had been so oriented in a works system of practice as a monk and as a Catholic believer that when he became a uh, a believer in Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace, he had a hard time with anything that g- gave him memories of what he used to live under. So just, you know, just think of people and when, you're, when they say some of those things, just remember what I said earlier about all men. All men have issues. You live with them long enough, you'll find out just what those issues are. And so Martin Luther had an issue with this and it's just, but it, it's scripture. God has said that this is the scriptures. Uh, patience and trials, practice of truth. Chapter two, partiality, that's like, you know, uh, prejudice, bigotry, these kind of things, class warfare, these things are rebuked and productivity is revealed. Who is the productive person? That's, you know, the perfection of the tongue. How can you be a mature believer? A mature believer is one who knows when to talk and when not to talk. It's pretty simple, you know. And then the, Chapter 4, the root and remedy for sin. And then chapter 5, earthly treasures reviled, perseverance and trials. Don't think of what's coming for you. All right. So it's, all right, so these are, okay. So James, remember the poor. Faith evidence. Like if you ignore the poor, this is, you know, this is, might be an evidence that you, you don't really have an active faith going on inside you. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith are dead. So, you know, they go together. There's the root and the fruit. It's a mystery. Now, the thing is that people talk about like the works part of it, and they talk about Abraham and Rahab. These are the examples that, that he uses here. Uh, let's see here. Um, where is it? it? says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? By works, faith was made perfect. And likewise, verse 25, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay, what do you know about Abraham and Rahab? I got it up there. Don't look. What is it? They were both liars. Abraham, so if he's trying to say that you have to work, if, you know, some people will use this and say that, you know, you have to work to keep your faith and you have to go to Abraham and Rahab and they both told lies. Rahab said, no, the spies are not on my roof. They went out that way. Run quickly, you know. And like they said, well, you know, but she had a justifiable lie. What's a justifiable lie? What's a justifiable, you know. So there's white lies and black lies. Abraham lied. Abraham's lie almost... You know, so I'm just saying, like, you know, some people come to this. See, I told you, you got to work. You got you to work to keep your faith. Yeah, Abraham was a liar. Rahab was a liar. And he uses those as the example. So that's just, you know. And then throughout this book, we have, uh, you know, we, we know where James come from. James was from, from Nazareth and Galilee, where his family grew up. So we, we have a lot of ideas of waves and flowers and rain and drought and crops, you know. Paul used the examples of the city, the athletics, the, uh, the soldiers, the things that he had seen, the slave pictures that he made. Uh, but uh, James was like more of, you know, more, uh, well, used more parable-like kind of explanations like Jesus. Okay, what do we need to know? Faith produces a life that's according to the will of God, and mature faith gives us perfect victory over temptation. So that when you're a mature, when you get to a certain point in mature faith, then temptation comes and it's not, your reaction is not like, yeah, I want to do that. You know, the reaction is more like when you have a mature faith, no, I don't do that. And that's, you know, that's a process. Why do we need to know? A life of faith is a life of conflict and peril. A life of faith is also a life of power. It's, it's true. Next part. Uh, what do we need to do? Let faith kill the class distinctions. Like we don't have a class system. Let faith kill strife and let faith produce true communion. 
And why do we need to do this? It reveals the superiority of Christ's kingdom and our resistance. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Okay, let me give you your lasting lesson. And um, this is really the tongue. My brethren, um, let not many of you become teachers, seeing that we shall receive the stricter judgment, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, all, uh, also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouth, and they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at ships. They have a large, they, they are large, driven by fierce wind, but they are turned by a very small rudder. This is the point. Even the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. How great a forest, how great a forest, a little fire kindles. The tongue is set, is a fire, a world of iniquity. And so the mature tongue is the product of a mature heart. Psalm 141 tells us this. Says Psalm 141 says, Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to help me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up my hands as, uh, as, um, as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips and do not incline my heart to any evil thing. Okay, here's the, that's the prayer. Lord, set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over my lips. That's the thing. There's a thing that we need to, to understand, that words do do something. That was the message of our church last night, the message of, the, of uh, you know, the silly string. Did you see me get sprayed with silly string? Okay, yeah. That was the message. Words do something. They get on you. They get in you, and they create some, some problems in your, in your consciousness. So be careful with that. Like, be careful what you say. Be careful what you receive in what people are saying. Um, so uh, put away these things, these things that you you're, think to put away these things, envy and sow so peace. Put away envy and learn to sow peace into your heart. So you are in control. If your tongue is under God's control, you will take what you say seriously and your whole body will be under his discipline. Just like a the rider of the horse controls the whole animal because of that little thing that's in the mouth. The little thing in your mouth, learn how to control that. You're outspoken, out of your unspoken words, you are the master. Of your spoken words, you are the servant. Of your written words, you are the slave. That's an old proverb from uh, the Amish. But... You know, so of your unspoken words, you are the master. That means what you say, what you haven't said, you're still under control. If you speak words, then you are their servant. If you write something down, if you send an email, you are the slave to that. You understand that? Post something in the wrong place in the internet world, and you are a slave to it. So be careful what you think, be careful what you say, and definitely be careful what you write and send. Once you write and send something, it's right there and it's irrevocable, right? It's like you can't take it back, you know. You can apologize for it, but the fact is is that you wrote it and you sent it and it became a part of the system of communication. So, all right, that's it for tonight, I think. Yes, it is. Okay, that's it for tonight. So, uh, Thank you very much for being a kind and attentive group of people listening to me ramble on for another three hours and uh, helping me through this momentous time in my life. Thank you. All right. All those on the other end, you're helping me too. Thank you for being with us tonight. And uh, Lord, bless us, keep us, watch over us as we go. Again, we just remember those folks in, uh, in Massachusetts and everything that's going on there. Just protect our nation. Give us wisdom. Give our leaders wisdom in your name. Amen.